Hello everyone. In the previous lectures, we have learned about the definition of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, applications of machine learning, what are the classification of machine learning tasks. Then we have learned about how to define a machine learning problem, how to design a machine learning system. Then we have seen what is the role of machine learning in spam email detection. Today we are going to discuss about the ingredients of machine learning and particularly about tasks and their classification. Myself is Dr. GNVD Sirisha working as assistant professor in the department of computer science and engineering in SRKR engineering college. The objectives of today's lecture are to learn about the ingredients of machine learning, understand what is a task and classification of tasks, understand the concepts of supervised learning, unsupervised learning and semi-supervised learning and understand how to evaluate the performance of a task. Ingredients of machine learning. Machine learning is all about using the right features to build the right models that achieve the right task. Features define the language in which we describe the relevant objects in our domain. We should not normally have to go back to the domain objects themselves once we have a suitable feature representation. A task is an abstract representation of a problem we want to solve regarding these domain objects. The most common form of these is classifying them into two or more classes. Many of the tasks can be represented as a mapping from data points to outputs. The mapping or model is itself produced as the output of machine learning algorithm applied to training data. Tasks Tasks are the problems that we want to solve with machine learning. The most common machine learning tasks are Predictive in the sense that they concern predicting a target variable from features. Descriptive tasks are concerned with exploiting underlying structure in the data. Machine learning tasks include binary classification where we want to predict a categorical target. For example, if you take the spam email recognition comes under the binary classification task. One obvious variation is to consider classification problems with more than two classes. For instance, we may want to distinguish different emails into spam and ham and again in ham we want to distinguish between work related emails and private messages. So there are three classes now, spam emails, work related emails and private messages. We could approach this problem by using two binary classification tasks. The first task is to distinguish between spam and ham and the second task is among ham emails we want to distinguish between work related and private ones. However, some potentially useful information may be lost in this way. As some spam emails tend to look like private rather than work related messages. For this reason, it is often beneficial to view multi-class classification as a separate machine learning task on its own right. Sometimes we need to predict a real number. It might be useful to have an assessment of an incoming email's urgency on a sliding scale. Now this task will become regression and essentially involves learning a real valued function from training examples labeled with true function values. For example, I might construct such a training set by randomly setting a number of emails from my inbox and labeling them with an urgency score on a scale of 0 to 10. This typically works by choosing a class of functions and constructing a function which minimizes the difference between predicted and true function values. Unsupervised learning. 
Under unsupervised learning, first of all, let us discuss what is meant by clustering. Both classification and regression assume that the availability of training set of examples labeled with true classes or function values. The task of grouping data without prior information on the groups is called clustering. Learning from unlabeled data is called unsupervised learning and is quite distinct from supervised learning, which requires labeled training data. A typical clustering algorithm works by assessing the similarity between instances and putting similar instances in the same cluster and dissimilar instances in different clusters. For example, how to measure similarity between objects. If our emails are described by word occurrence features, as in the text classification example, the similarity of emails could be measured in terms of the words they have in common. For instance, we would take the number of common words in two emails and divide it by the number of words occurring in either email. This measure is called jacket coefficient. Suppose one email contains 42 different words, another contains 112 different words, and two emails have 23 words in common, then the similarity would be 0 0.18. We can then cluster our emails into groups such that the average similarity of an email to other emails in its group is much larger than the average similarity to the emails from other groups. Under unsupervised learning, the second task is association analysis. There are many patterns that can be learned from data in an unsupervised way. Association rules are a kind of patterns that are popular in marketing applications and the result of such patterns can often be found on online shopping websites. Association rules are mined from items that frequently occur together. These algorithms consider only the items that occur a minimum number of times. The association rules has a number of applications like item recommendation in online shopping sites. Unsupervised learning. Let us see how unsupervised learning can be used for identifying the hidden structure in the data. The method that we can use is called matrix decomposition. Like all other machine learning models, patterns are a manifestation of underlying structure in data. Sometimes the structure takes the form of hidden variable, much like unobservable, but nevertheless, explanatory quanti quantities in physics like energy. For example, consider the matrix that is given here. This matrix represents the ratings that are given by six different people for four different movies on a scale of 0 to 3. We can decompose this matrix into three sub-matrices like shown below. Here the first and third matrices are Boolean matrices, whereas the second matrix is a diagonal matrix. Rows in the third matrix represent the genres like crime, drama, and comedy. Columns represents the four movies. So the third matrix shows the genre to which each movie belongs. The first matrix expresses the people's preferences in terms of genres. Here you can see there are three genres that are taken here, crime, drama, and comedy. We can see that the first, fourth, and fifth person like drama. The fourth and fifth person like crime films. And third, fifth, and sixth person like comedies. The middle matrix shows the crime genre is twice as important as other genres. So the middle matrix gives us the importance of each genre. So now the third matrix gives the relationship between genres and movies, that is to which genre each movie belongs. First matrix gives the preferences of each person regarding their genres and second matrix gives the importance of each genre. Semi-supervised learning. 
In many problem domains, data is cheap, but label data is expensive. For example, in web page classification, you have the whole world wide web at your disposal, but constructing a labeled training set is a very pain taking process. One possible approach is semi supervised learning. Use small label training set to build an initial model which is then refined using the unlabeled data. For example, we could use the initial model to make predictions on unlabeled data and use the most confident predictions as the new training data after which we retrain the model on this enlarged training set. So this is what is called as semi-supervised learning. Evaluating the performance on a task. In machine learning, like for example, spam email filter, we can safely assume that the perfect spam email filter will not exist. If it did, spammers would immediately reverse engineer to find out ways to trick the spam filter into thinking that a spam email is actually ham. In many cases, the data is noisy. Examples may be mislabeled or features may contain errors, in which case it would be detrimental to try too hard to find a model that correctly classifies the training data because it would lead to overfitting and hence would not generalize to new data. In many cases, the features used to describe the data only give an indication of what their class might be but don't, don't contain enough signal to predict the class perfectly. For these and other reasons, machine learners take performance evaluation of learning algorithms very seriously. We need to have some idea of how well an algorithm is expected to perform on new data, not in terms of runtime or memory usage, although this is also an important issue, but in terms of classification performance. Suppose we want to find out how well our newly trained spam filter does. One thing we can do is count the number of correctly classified emails, both ham and spam, and divide by total number of examples to get a proportion which is called accuracy of the classifier. However, this method does not indicate whether our model has overfitted the data or not. A better idea would be to use only 90% of data for training and the remaining 10% for test set. If overfitting occurs, the test set performance will be considerably lower than training set performance. However, even if we select the test instances randomly from data, every once in a while we may get lucky if most of the test instances are similar to training instances or unlucky if the test insta instances happen to be very different from training instances. In practice, this train test split is therefore repeated a number of times and this process is called cross validation. This works as follows. We randomly di divide the data into 10 parts of equal size and use 9 parts of training for training and 1 part for testing. We do this 10 times, using each part once for testing. At the end, we compute the average test performance. Cross-validation can also be applied to other supervised learning algorithms. No free lunch theorem. A related problem is stated by the no free lunch theorem, which states that no learning algorithm can outperform another when evaluated over all possible classification problems and thus the performance of any learning algorithm or the set of all possible learning problems is no better than random guessing. So today we have learnt about the ingredients of machine learning, what are tasks, what is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning and why it is very important to assess the performance of machine learning tasks. Thank you.